Good morning, welcome to our week four lab. This week we're gonna focus a lot on Olympic training, Olympic weightlifting, and uh, we'll talk a bit about the integration of plyometrics into that training. And so as we said last week, this is really a, an extension of what we talked about, what we demonstrated uh, in last week's lab. This is more advanced content, but it's important for you to know as uh, future healthcare providers, I think, uh, especially ones that will be working with athletes. Um, today we're going to be talking a lot about max power. Now remember power is basically just force which is generated over time, but max power is the maximum amount of force which is produced in the smallest amount of time. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on today with these uh, Olympic lifts. Um, specifically we're going to be talking about the clean uh, and jerk and then also the snatch, which is really just moving uh, uh, an amount of weight um, from the ground to over our head. And really what we're focusing on here is optimizing force transfer um, by using uh, the entire body and throughout the entire body. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about plyometrics also. So the progression of today's lab will be as follows. We're gonna discuss first periodization and why that's so important, which is discussed quite a bit in your readings from this week. Then we'll move into talking briefly about plyometrics and some of the skills we can learn from that. And then we're gonna talk uh, and demonstrate a number of the Olympic lifts um, and then the assessments of some of those movements uh, at more of an introductory level and then we're going to talk about the progression of that to more of an advanced advanced level so we hope you enjoy today's lab okay so now we want to talk about actually periodizing for strength over time and one of the biggest things that we really need to understand before going into strength training and before going into Olympic lifting is that strength takes a really long time to actually build um, and maintain. So strength training, while you can get very, very strong and in things like agility, uh, quickness, balance, things like that peak in your 20s. When you actually think about getting stronger, adaptations for getting stronger take years and years. So you actually notice that peak strength in athletes tends to peak somewhere in the 30s and even 40s. And this is exemplified by some of the most powerful Olympic athletes and power athletes, uh, excuse me, powerlifting athletes on the planet. A lot of them are in their uh, early to mid 30s. Okay, so that's one major consideration is that this is a long-term adaptation that we're going for and requires a lot of focus on technique, a lot of focus on your uh, muscular tendon of stiffness and, uh, and just generation of uh, the physiological adaptations required for, uh, for strength and power. So as we just mentioned, strength and power both require significant anatomical adaptations uh, for both the average and the elite level athletes. So a couple of adaptations that you definitely undergo are muscle hypertrophy and uh, muscle strengthening. So you're increasing the force of your contraction. And then your tendons get stiffer based on the movement that you're actually performing. And the ligaments get stronger in the general areas. There's a lot of load, a lot of forces going into those joints. So you wanna make sure that um, those areas are nice and stable so that when you catch or when you're moving, nothing is giving way and you're able to transfer the uh, maximum amount of force. And one final adaptation that uh, doesn't necessarily come to mind right away is the uh, bone density. Your bone density increases with strength and resistance training. In one of your readings this week, a review by Bird and colleagues from 2005, several neuromuscular adaptations to resistance training are discussed. And as you'll recall, we talked about adaptations quite a bit last week. A few things though that I do wanna highlight. Cole just talked about hypertrophy. Um, that's really important to mention. Uh, and as discussed in Bird, there's a few things that, that I'd like to just review quickly. And the first is that we can see uh, hypertrophic effects in each muscle fiber type as a result of resistance training. So we see an increase in cross-sectional area in type 1 fibers, type 2A fibers, and type 2B fibers. However, evidence seems pretty clear that when strength training is done properly, that the greatest increase uh, in muscle fiber size occurs in type 2A fibers, followed then by type 2B fibers and type 1 fibers, which are slow twitch, but are uh, the most fatigue resistant those see the, the least amount of growth uh, per cross-sectional area. Um, we also need to talk a little bit about strength. And the point I wanna bring up here is that we, we tend to see very few uh, differences per cross-sectional area in, in muscle strength between male and female athletes. In other words, we do see similar strength-related adaptations, um, which is really quite interesting. Um, per cross-sectional area, 
And so that, uh, that continues to, to add to the current consensus that male and female athletes should be trained very similarly and should be sport specific rather than gender specific. And finally, I just wanted to talk about change in muscle fiber types uh, as a result of strength training. Um, there are certainly changes which occur, but it appears that most of the evidence um, suggests that the change happens mostly within type 2 fibers. We can see type, type 2A fibers switch to, to type 2B and type 2B back to type 2A. But uh, just from resistance training and strength training, we don't see any significant change from type 1 fibers to type 2 and type 2 to type 1. That's very important to mention. Now please bear in mind that we're not talking about aerobic training here. We're talking about resistance training, strength training. There's a whole other set of liter literature for aerobic training. But these are some of the major changes that we, that we need to, to highlight and remember. Um, just to review, I would encourage that you go back and look at some of those adaptation articles from last week where other uh, adaptations were discussed as a result of resistance training, hormonal, and, and at, the, at the, the, the neuro level also. Those are some things that I encourage you to have a look at. So when we're actually periodizing for strength training and resistance training and specifically Olympic lifting, we actually want to consider the stability of the joints and then the strength of the joints or in the strength of the muscles before we actually begin starting our power movements. So ideally, a client would go through a series of periodized cycles where they start with stability and then really focus on balance and focus on, uh, focus on each of the individual joints. And this can be a lot of isometric training. Um, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of stability training, and then we go into the actual maximal strength portion where they begin to increase the loads on the muscles, and then finally in the power portion where they're working at lower loads but they're increasing their work effort, um, and this is what uh, sort of stands on top of the basis of the strength and the stability portion. So we always sort of go in that pyramid style where we focus on stability at the base of the pyramid, and then strength, and then the power at the top of the pyramid. Okay, so now let's talk about plyometric training. Plyometric training is really nice because it's easily accessible to a lot of clients. Um, there's no body weight really, uh, or it's just body weight, so there's no real weight required unless you're trying to uh, do some more advanced things. And you can also, um, you can also use it to train for a, a various number of functional patterns across different sports, just across daily life. Um, for example, if we talk about jumping. Uh, jumping actually takes us through a couple of different stretch shortening cycles. This is something that we'll refer to a couple of times later on. But the stretch shortening cycle is a common pattern in a lot of functional movements. So if you can just consider jumping, um, for whenever we're jumping, if we drop down, we're actually going to be lengthening the quad. So the quad is stretching at the, uh, at the base of the movement. So we lengthen the quad, so we stretch, and then we shorten in order to generate power. So you can um, sort of liken this to a rubber band where you're generating power by pulling the rubber band out and back in. So it's the stretch and shortening cycle that's creating, that's creating power. Now we're just going to briefly discuss the different phases in plyometric training, but first in order to do that we need to talk a little bit about the stretch shortening cycle. So you may have heard this term before, but the stretch shortening cycle is, is a functional muscle pattern uh, that we use in a number of movements from jumping to, uh, to sitting down and standing up uh, in order to create uh, energy in order to uh, do work. So uh, in order to, to think about this, you can think of a rubber band, um, and this will be our uh, sort of a hypothetical model throughout the, uh, throughout the discussion here. So the very first phase is the eccentric phase. This is essentially the pre-stretching of the muscle of the prime mover in order to utilize the stretch reflex to build potential energy. All that means is that um, as, we're, as we're going down, like in the example showed earlier, we're lengthening the muscle. Uh, and you can akin this to stretching the rubber band, but uh, this is important because this increases muscle spindle activity uh, to create the stretch reflex. And the stretch reflex is something specific to the muscle physiology that allows us to actually uh, sort of snap those muscles back. Uh, the next phase is is the amortization phase. Um, it's, a, it's a fancy term for the transition phase between the eccentric and concentric phases. And here the efficiency is extremely important. So this is what we consider the stabilization phase and the joint and core stability of the, uh, of the athlete is absolutely critical in how well the amortization phase transfers energy from the eccentric into the concentric phase. So you can think of, in this case, the rubber band. The rubber band, if we look at it, it seems like it's an instantaneous snap between stretching and then when you let it go. But it's actually a very, very brief moment where it pauses and the material inside it is transitioning the energy from the, uh, the built-up elastic energy into the 
uh, into the energy that is released when the rubber band is let go. And then finally we have the concentric phase, which is where all of the energy is released. This is when you re uh, let the rubber band go, or this is when you actually uh, complete the jump. This is when you stand up from the chair, things like that. So the concentric phase is the actual force generation, uh, the force generated and transferred into whatever surface you are standing on. Now that we have the context for the movements, let's go ahead and review a few examples of plyometric training movements that you can perform yourself or with clients. These first few movements demonstrated by Dr. Connolly are movements that are very common in rehab facilities for uh, lower body rehab. And they are excellent ways to generate stability and a little bit of calf strength for the clients prior to actually starting actual jump training, which is a little bit more high impact. These next few exercises can be done by placing a little X on the ground as shown here in the video. So the first one is a double leg hop laterally over the line. You can make this a little bit more difficult by turning it into a single leg hop on uh, one or the other leg. Just, just note that you should train both legs whenever doing this. And if the client is having a little bit of trouble, they may need to go back to the double leg. So this is a, it's a progression step. Next is the double leg hop front and back. Note that each time the client is clearing the line, make sure that they're actually able to clear the line consistently. And again, increasing the difficulty a little bit with a single leg hop. Each of the movements up till now has been a single planar movement, but now we can go into a multi-planar movement by doing a couple of preset patterns on the, uh, on the cross that's down there on the ground. Note here that the client should definitely show some proficiency in the previous movements before moving on to this. They need some ankle stability, some calf strength, things like that, before they actually move on to doing some pattern jumping. Note that you can really do any pattern for your clients and that you should also make sure that you train these patterns symmetrically. So if they're going one direction, they should also train in the other direction. Uh, but here you can also see that we go to a more difficult version, the single leg hop as well. Next is the ice skater movement. This is a lateral bounding, so we're going from hopping to bounding now. Note here that uh, this does require a little bit of lateral ankle stability. So if there are some lateral uh, stability issues, those need to be addressed before starting these. Here's another version called the Heisman Steps. This is a slightly more reactive version of the ice skater training, and this is going to train speed, agility, and quickness. Next, we're going to demo a few jump training movements, and we're going to start from the lower difficulty up to the higher difficulty movements using boxes. This first version is a air squat jump, where they go into an air squat and then jump straight up just to get a couple of inches off of the ground. Notice the ankle flexion, knee flexion, and hip flexion at the very top. This next version of the squat jump is essentially a reach squat jump where they are starting with their hands low and they're going to use their hands to generate momentum to go up. This is the type of jump that a lot of basketball players make use of. And finally, a slightly more difficult version of the squat jump where we actually will take our knees and bring them to our chest at the top of the jump. Uh, this allows us to go through a couple of extra stretch shortening cycles within the movement, so it's a little bit more difficult. One of my personal favorites is the box jump, and note here that I'm testing out the height of the box first by do performing a tuck jump. So the tuck jump is a precursor to the actual box jump height here. And then next, we're going to move up onto the box by getting my knees to my chest and bounding forward just a little bit to get on top of the box. And then I'm going to stand it all the way up at the top and then come down nice and gently. Note here that you can also jump up to the top and then step down with one leg as opposed to jumping down. This is a little bit uh, more of a lower impact version of the uh, step down. If your client is having a hard time jumping down and going through that eccentric phase, we can actually train that eccentric phase right here by performing simple box drops. So what they're going to do is they're just going to step off of the box and then stabilize themselves at the very bottom of the movement. Notice here that when I'm dropping, I'm not just uh, standing right back up. I'm actually pausing for just a brief moment. I'm giving all of my joints and tendons a moment to understand what's going on. This is increasing the stability for the movement itself and increasing the stability of that amortization phase that's about to happen. 
Now we're going to add a little bit more of a reactive portion in it by dropping down and then hopping straight back up. Note here that I'm not going to full depth because I'm trying to get some knee stability, ankle stability in here. Uh, notice that this is a little bit tough on the ankle joints, so just make sure that the clients don't have any ankle uh, problems and address ankle stability before moving to this more difficult version. And then finally, a couple examples of the actual drop jump. This is going to allow us to start stringing together some box jumps later on. And finally, we have some power step up movements. Uh, the very first version that I'm showing here is just the actual power step up, where we're stepping to the top of the box and then driving through, starting to build some single leg power here. The next version is the actual power step up, where we're driving through and hopping at the top of the movement, landing back on that same foot that we're driving through. So we're both getting some bounding or a little bit of hopping here, and also some stability on the way back down. So that concludes our plyometric training demonstrations. However, we wanted to end with a couple of plyometric training variables here. So we've already manipulated a couple of these for some of the movements that we saw in the beginning. The hop training, we manipulated some double single leg movements. We changed the uh, amount of planes that we were moving in. We were going from lateral planes, for, uh, frontal plane, and, uh, and we changed the range of motion in a couple of movements. However, we didn't really discuss the t uh, these last five here. So. So first we have the type and amount of resistance that you can apply. So uh, just at rest we're using the resistance of gravity whenever we're fighting against any of these movements. But we can also add in resistance bands to increase the resistance, uh, make it a little bit more difficult, things like that. The next thing that uh, you're going to manipulate is the actual speed of the movement, so how fast somebody is moving through. Again, you want them to be moving through at a safe speed for their current capabilities, but as we start to get more stable, as we start to get stronger and we're able to generate more power, ideally we would be working through more speed in order to maintain these gains. So the next variable you can manipulate is the phase of focus. So you remember from the previous discussion about the different phases of plyometric training, here you can actually uh, emphasize a different portion of the movement in order, to train a, uh, in, to, in order to train something specific. So for example, the phase of focus, we did manipulate this a little bit using our drop jump uh, our drop jump progressions going from the just single drop to stabilize. We're focusing on the eccentric phase. And then there's uh, the phase where we're going into the hop that's actually a, training a little bit of the amortization phase, how well we're able to transfer that force from the eccentric into the concentric portion. And then we can also train the concentric portion by just working strictly on the box jump from the base of the, from the bottom of the movement, or other ways to manipulate exist as well. So uh, you can also manipulate phase of focus. So these next two variables are duration and frequency, and these are actually somewhat related to speed because um, the, the faster you're moving, the likely the shorter the duration that you're able to move it at, and the faster you're moving, the higher the frequency. So um, ideally, you'd want to manipulate the variable of how long somebody is performing these movements and how often, and how often can include both uh, within a training session or periodized throughout, uh, throughout the course of their training. So you don't want to include something so often that it starts to create strain in, uh, in other portions of their body. So if you're including a lot of jump training when somebody hasn't previously been doing jump training, then their uh, Achilles tendon could get worn out, they could develop plantar fasciitis, um, they could develop shin splints, things like that. So just uh, keep in mind the frequency and the duration for their training programs, uh, as well as uh, all of these other variables that you can manip manipulate. So now, on to some Olympic lifting. So Olympic lifting is something that can take months or years to become proficient at, uh, just from a technique standpoint, much less actually getting strong and actually moving through some of those adaptation phases that we were discussing earlier in the video and have mentioned a few times by now. Um, the reason why we mention it so often is because it is really, really important, especially from a healthcare providing standpoint, you want to make sure that your clients are moving through at an appropriate pace. And if people aren't recovering well enough and they're not allowing their joints to adapt and they just keep beating their body into the ground over and over, um, that's going to generate a lot of business for you probably, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the client. Um, the client themselves are trying to do it for the long term. Most of them, from the average all the way to the uh, elite, want to continue moving well into their uh, well into their senior years. So what we're what we're really trying to 
emphasize here today is just the slow progression um, is important and that you don't necessarily need to be lifting above 200, 300 pounds within your first year of lifting. Um, just anecdotally, when I first started lifting, I definitely fell into the what we call the, uh, the beginner strength curve trap. Um, or rather the beginner strength curve. So uh, when, when you first start off lifting, as we mentioned earlier, your, your muscles get so strong so fast, but um, your body, your core takes time to learn how to stabilize and, and all of the joints take time to adapt. So when I first started, um, I had gotten into cleaning. And when I, uh, I did a clean and I did the clean with some impro improper technique at my own personal ego, uh, I was lifting a little bit too much for myself at the time and I actually herniated a disc in my back. So I ended up needing some physical therapy for my back and I later came back and I was much stronger and I've since then surpassed that weight significantly. Um, but the point is, is that it's really easy to get hurt and it's really easy to jump the gun and realize, hey, I'm getting strong really fast. Um, but we need to pull ourselves back from that and really, really focus on technique. So we're gonna talk a lot about technique today and I'm not gonna be loading up much more weight than just the empty bar in some of our demos, uh, just to be able to exemplify you that technique needs to look good with no weight and it looks the same whenever you start progressing to heavy weight. So one disclaimer before we officially move into some of our technique stuff is that technique is so important to the efficiency of the movement that in China, Chinese Olympic lifting athletes, athletes will sometimes spend years on a PVC pipe or on an empty bar without ever loading a significant amount of weight uh, in order to hone their technique and create body awareness through each portion of the movement. So if you're interested in some beautiful lifting, I highly recommend checking out uh, at Hook Grip on Instagram. This page is a highlight reel of some of the best male and female athletes across the world lifting two, sometimes three times their body weight. So next I'm going to break down the Olympic lifting technique for you into the three common pull phases that we usually consider for the Olympic lifts. So the three pulls are the first pull, the second pull, and the third pull. Uh, we're going to use my video right here to break down each of those pulls into, uh, into their separate phases. So all of this happens really fast, so we're going to break this down in slow motion. Very first we have the setup. In my setup, I'm set where my shoulders are directly over and slightly in front of the bar. My knees are over, tracking over my toes, and I'm getting ready to put tension into the bar. Next comes the first pull. This is where we move the weight from the ground to uh, the, just above the height of the knees or up to mid-thigh. Once we get the weight up to our mid-thigh, we're going to begin the transition from the first pull to the second pull. Um, this is a relatively seamless transition, but this transition is while we're still pulling up on the bar, we're moving the weight from the uh, upper thigh, mid-thigh, to our hip crease, and then we're trying to keep our, uh, our torso vertical at the end of the second pull. And that was pretty much it. If you blink, you'll miss it. So it's that transition from the uh, mid-thigh up to our hip crease is our second pull. From the second pull in the hip crease, we're going to come to triple extension, which we'll explain more deeply here in a moment, and then we're going to continue to pull on the bar. As the bar pulls up, we're going to pull ourselves under the bar and catch the weight onto our shoulders. So here are those reps again at full speed for just the squat clean. Uh, please note that the transition phase between each of the three different pulls is nearly instantaneous. And it's, uh, it's something that you want to be very seamless. Um, and the less seamless it is, the less efficient you are in the movement and the less weight that you're overall going to be able to move. Another thing to note here is the footwork between the uh, second and third pole phases. So these, uh, the, the footwork here is critical in the actual execution of the catch. So what I'm doing is I'm moving my feet outwards, I'm getting them off the ground so that I can simultaneously pull on the bar up as I fall under the bar to catch it. So one last thing that we're going to talk about here before we start learning the movement itself is the actual requirements for mobility in order to perform the Olympic lift. So you'll notice here that in the catch, uh, my knees are still over my toes, but I'm still in a deep squat. You do need to be capable of dropping into a squat in order to do an Olympic lift. That's a, uh, it's a necessary functionality just to be able to move. So uh, that requires significant ankle and hip mobility. 
And then you'll also notice that yeah, up in the front squat, uh, my wrists need to actually be able to move back and allow the weight to be able to rest on my shoulders. So this requires a lot of wrist and shoulder mobility. And then also you'll notice that my, uh, my torso is upright. If I lean forward in the movement, the weight is going to drop off of my shoulders and fall onto my knees. So that requires uh, significant thoracic mobility so that I'll be able to extend my chest up and be able to actually lift myself all the way up through the top of the movement. So next, I'm going to ask you to go grab yourself a PVC pipe or a broomstick or something, uh, something long and light that you're able to actually hold on to and perform a couple of these movements. Um, and you'll be able to use this for a couple of the movements right now and then in the next portion of the video as well. Um, but once you have that, we're going to practice a couple of the actual squat types that you need to know. It is a precursor for the strength requirement uh, for the Olympic lifting. So. Um, when you're squatting, or excuse me, when you're uh, Olympic lifting, you're going to be catching into a squat. The squat is the single most important portion of the movement in terms of, uh, in terms of a precursor, a stability portion. So you actually need to be able to build proficiency in each of these before you start to move on to learning some of the other neuromuscular patterns to generate the power needed for the Olympic movement. So uh, just a quick demo. The front squat is the type of squat that you're going to be using in order to catch the clean, okay? So whenever I catch a clean, it comes up here, I'm catching it here, and then I'm dropping into a front squat, okay? The front squat here, notice that my chest is upright, my elbows are in front of my shoulders, and the bar is resting up on my shoulders, okay? We're here, and I get a nice wide stance. My toes and my knees are going to be tracking here, nice and upright just like that, okay? We want to make sure that the bar is as much as we can stacked over our, our heels and uh, in between our feet at all times, in between our heels and our toes at all times, okay? So we're here. So next, let's talk about the overhead squat. The overhead squat is something that it can be severely limited by your thoracic and your shoulder mobility um, because you actually have the bar overhead and you need it to be able to stay overhead all the way deep into the squat. So this may be difficult for some of you, but I definitely recommend trying it out and it will kind of help you understand the limitations that a client might actually be undergoing whenever they're trying to learn the snatch as well, okay? Um, so the overhead squat, it's going to start either from uh, our shoulders here and we're just going to take the weight and we're going to press it straight out overhead or you can get it from a back rack and then you'll press the weight straight out overhead from the back rack just like this, okay? Now notice that once I have it overhead, my hands are uh, quite wide, definitely more than shoulder width apart, um, but it's not so wide that I, it's hanging um, sort of on, on the edge of my thumbs, okay? We want to be able to have a full grip on the bar. Once it's overhead, notice here that the bar is directly over my center of gravity. When I drop it, it's directly over the top of my head, sort of tracking over my ear, over my shoulders, hips, and my knees and my ankles, okay? So we're here, have it straight overhead. We get a nice, uh, a nice good wide squat stance, have it pressed overhead, chest upright, and we drop into the overhead squat. From another angle, we have the overhead squat right here. So being capable of performing both of those squats is critical to performance in the uh, Olympic lifts. So um, there is a direct translation of strength to the overhead, from the overhead squat to the snatch and from the front squat to the clean. Really, what we're saying here is you need to be squatting if you're gonna be doing Olympic lifting. And squatting um, nearly uh, nearly two to three times a week, sometimes five to six times a week for Olympic or elite athletes, okay? So this is a very, very core piece of the training for all Olympic lifting, okay? So this is something you should be proficient in and it is critical to your success um, and the success of your clients as well. So next, we're gonna talk about one of the most important neuromuscular patterns that you can learn for Olympic lifting and this is triple extension. Triple extension is when you are fully extended at the ankle joints, at the knee joints and at the hip joints, okay? So basically fully standing, but all the way extended at everything right here. You reach triple extension in a lot of functional movements um, as, as exemplified by some of our plyometric training, um, which is the reason why we discuss plyometrics and power uh, in, the same, in the same sentence. Um, plyometric training reaches triple extension in a lot of the movements because you're jumping. So I'm here, 
Notice at the very top of the movement while I was in the air, I was here, here, and here, full extension all the way at the top, okay? That's important in generating power, and the more efficient that I can get in reaching triple extension, the more power I can generate through triple extension, the higher I'll be able to jump, the more weight I'll be able to move, um, and the more functional that I'll be with any movement that requires that neuromuscular pattern, specifically the squat and the clean and jerk. So for this next demo, we're gonna grab our handy dandy PVC pipe or broomstick, and we're actually gonna try and do a sumo deadlift high pull. This is a common transitional movement in learning the pattern of triple extension. And then after this, we'll get into um, an example for a medicine, uh, a med ball clean. So we'll be able to start putting together the actual catch. So first, let's get into um, the sumo deadlift high pull. So sumo deadlift high pull is gonna be starting with our feet uh, rather wide, definitely more than shoulder width, okay? And we're gonna have the bar is gonna be um, with a nice narrow grip. So this is where the sumo comes from. Sumo right here is a nice good, is a starting position. My knees are tracking over my toes and my chest is upright and everything is nice and stacked. The actual sumo deadlift would be here and then we add a high pull at the end up here, just like that. So nice and slow, we're here, here, Elbows nice and high, just like that. So what this is doing is it's actually training the patterns for the pull in the clean and in the snatch, okay? So throughout the clean and the snatch, we're gonna be pulling, 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 all the way up, just like this. And then eventually with the snatch, we're here, we rotate under it, or with the clean, our elbows rotate and we catch just like that. Okay? So you can see the neuromuscular pattern that might be trained through the sumo deadlift high pull. We're here, just like this, just like that. Okay? You can add in the extra extension at the top by generating more power by going to full triple extension. So we're here, and I actually generate full triple extension at the top of the movement. Notice here from this angle, the bar is staying nice and close to my body the whole time. You wanna keep that bar, just like in the deadlift from last week, here, all the way super close to the body, tracking back down, okay? It's really important that you learn, um, that you learn the sumo deadlift high pull before transitioning into the clean or in the snatch. So the next moment we're gonna discuss is the medicine ball clean. And this is a really, really great way to learn how to catch and drop under um, after reaching triple extension. So um, for the med ball clean, this is gonna bring us through the entire version of the clean without any significant weight. And we'll demo this with a ball and with a backpack later on, just in case you don't have a ball to demo at home, okay? So here's what the medicine ball clean looks like at full speed. A couple of things to note here. Notice that the ball isn't really rotating in space, okay? I'm actually pulling up, I reach triple extension, and once the ball is weightless, I'm rotating around the ball and catching and dropping under it. So again here, nice and exaggerated. So again, if you don't have a medicine ball, then you can actually do this as really any odd object or some sort of symmetrical object that you can kind of throw around. You can uh, load up a backpack or just grab a regular backpack um, with no weight on it and you can try it just like that. So here's the example with my backpack, okay? So we're here, dropping down between our legs, pop, just like that. So it's a little bit flat so it might hit you in the face, but notice that the backpack didn't rotate or change in space. I accommodated the backpack and moved around it in space just like that, okay? So here's this med ball clean from another angle, from the forward angle. Here, nice and tight. 
Alright, so in this last portion of the video, we're going to start going through the snatch and the clean and jerk in terms of the actual movement progressions uh, using a warm-up that I actually really like to use for myself personally. So what I'll do is I will go through this whole warm-up on an empty bar or a PVC pipe prior to loading up any weight. And what this does is it helps uh, me get into the mindset and uh, start feeling how my body is in space before actually starting each of the movements. So uh, what we will ask you to do at the end of the video is actually pick one of these progressions and go through it yourself a couple of times. So pay close attention and, uh, and grab a video camera. So here I'm demoing the snatch deadlift. What I'll do is I'll first grab the bar and I will get a nice wide grip on it and I'll set it into my hip crease to make sure that it's at the right height. And then I just drop down into a deadlift down to about mid shin, keeping my torso upright and my back around the same angle throughout the entire movement. Here we see it from another angle. You'll notice that my shoulders are over or in front of the bar at all times during the movement, even all the way up till the hip crease, and the angle of my back stays relatively similar throughout most of the movement. Next is the hang high pull. This is going to train the second and third pull transition. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting full triple extension into the hip crease and doing a nice high pull to get a good feeling for getting my elbows nice and high and the bar up to my chest. Next is a muscle snatch demo. This muscle snatch is a really great way to train the third pull and actually pulling yourself under the bar. Here you'll notice that once it gets up to the top, I'm doing an aggressive punch through in order to get the bar above my head. The aggressive punch is the key here. So for the hang power snatch demo, this is uh, training the second and third pull in, uh, in full. So I'm leaving the sound on so you can hear that click right there of me actually performing the footwork of getting my knees out wide as I pull the bar, um, pull the bar up and I pull myself under the bar as well. The light is really light so I don't have to drop under into a squat very much, but I'm pulling up on the bar as I'm dropping under it as well. Here's another uh, angle for the overhead squat that we practiced from earlier, but this is with a little bit of weight. Notice here that I'm getting my hip crease below my knees, I'm dropping fully, and the angle of my back is staying nice and upright. I'm able to perform this with full mobility. And finally, when you're ready, you put everything together into a full snatch. This is starting from the ground all the way up to the top. Notice that all three phases of the movement, the first, second, and third pull, are continuous here, and then I stand the movement up in a nice overhead squat. So this would be a great way to, using all of those movements, this is a great way to actually warm up, as well as learn the actual movement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put all of the movements together in one to two reps of each um, for a comprehensive warm-up routine. So now we're going to show a clean movement progression, which uses all of the same movements, just uh, fitted for the clean grip and the clean, uh, the clean movement itself. And then afterwards, we're going to show you the jerk technique and the jerk movement progression as well. And then finally, we'll put those two together for a full clean and jerk demo at the very end. 
The clean deadlift is very similar to the snatch deadlift. We're just in a clean grip. Notice that I'm setting up and it's not quite up in the hip crease, but it is on the high thigh as a result of how low my arms are hanging. And I am making sure to keep my torso nice and upright, chin forward, shoulders remaining over or in front of the bar at all times throughout the movement. Bar is nice and close to my body throughout the whole movement as well. The hang clean high pull is uh, the same as the snatch high pull, but we're, we're training here the second to third pull transition with high elbows, knuckles facing down the whole time, and making sure to keep the bar nice and close to our body. The muscle clean is a great way to learn about any mobility limitations that you might have. You should be able to take the bar or the PVC pipe and place it right up on your shoulders and rotate those elbows forward. Especially from this angle, you can see that my elbows are coming all the way forward through and that my arms are rotating around the bar, not necessarily reverse curling it up on. And that same thing transitions over here to the hang power clean, which is training the second and third pull in combination with the catch. We're bending over, we're getting the power, and you even hear that click the same way we did in the snatch. And the bar is resting on my shoulders, catching right in a nice uh, ready front squat position. Again, another front squat demo here. Notice that my hands are still gripping the bar, um, although it's up on my fingertips. And it's up on my shoulders, my elbows are staying in front, and my chest is upright. Now on the full clean, very similar to the demo from the very beginning of the Olympic lifting video. Your full clean with empty weight should look very similar to the full clean with weight on it. Also, one last note on the terminology here. Uh, you'll notice that I said power clean, power uh, power snatch, full clean, full snatch, things like that. Uh, power clean is a clean that is caught above parallel, whereas a full clean or a squat clean, as it's sometimes called, is whenever it's um, above or below parallel, and that's for the squat itself in the catch. Next, let's dive into the jerk movement progression. This is relatively quick, and then we'll get to the final pieces of the video. So for learning the jerk, we're going to start off with the uh, more static version, which is the shoulder press or the military press. You're just going to stand in place, stay nice and braced, and put the bar up on your shoulders and press straight through. You'll notice that I'm moving my chin out of the way of the bar, and this is more evident here in the lateral view, so that I can press straight through without having to worry about uh, my head being in the way. Otherwise, you'll clack your chin. Next is the push press to start getting the idea of that, uh, that very slight knee bend. Notice that when I am knee bending, it's not a lot. I'm just getting enough for my hips to drop a couple of inches, and then I'm using that momentum by exploding up and driving through. This will turn into triple extension later on in the more advanced portions of the movement. But again, I'm still moving my chin out of the way, and I'm pushing and pressing straight through the top. The thing that differentiates the push press from the push jerk is a jerk is actually a rebend. So you'll notice that as it comes up, I rebend my knees and move my feet outwards to push myself under the bar as the weight is starting to fall. So it's very, very similar to the catch in the clean or the snatch where you're pushing under as the bar is moving up. And finally, we have the split jerk, which is the most common way to perform heavy, uh, heavy, heavy jerks uh, following the clean. So here we're actually taking our feet and we're splitting them uh, front and back. This is why it's called the split jerk. And I'm pushing myself under the bar as the bar is going up at the exact same time. Very similar to the push jerk earlier.
So here we're also demoing the squat jerk, but this isn't something that I recommend that you try out. This is, uh, you have to be very, very mobile in order to be able to perform this at the very bottom. Uh, and this is very common in Chinese weightlifting. Chinese weightlifters uh, like this because you are able to drop much deeper into the bottom and you have a bit of an advantage with regards to mobility. So it allows them to be able to push weight. So here's the full clean and jerk demo. Notice how at the end of the clean, when I stand it up, I readjust my hands and then I go through for the jerk. So we'll watch one more time. Starting from the mid shin, shoulders over, getting tension. Pushing through and split jerk, nice and stable. If for your movement demo you decide to do the clean and jerk, definitely recommend doing the split jerk or the push jerk version. Do not try the squat jerk at home. So we're getting towards the end of the video, uh, but that pretty much wraps up all of our demos for Olympic lifting. So finally we wanted to uh, leave you with some considerations for advancing through Olympic lifting. The very first thing that I'm going to tell you is uh, do not perform these lifts with weight without a coach or professional. Um, it's, it'll be great for you to be able to demo these out and try these out with a PVC pipe at home. However, if you do plan on lifting, uh, lifting weight or you do enjoy these movements or you, you find them interesting, I definitely recommend finding an Olympic lifting coach or going to a CrossFit box and finding someone with a USAW weightlifting certification or find someone with a weightlifting certification that can really help you out. And uh, it, it is really important that you consider everything from stability and mobility that we had discussed earlier in the video and just, just really uh, listen to your body and don't, don't let your ego get to your head if you're planning on advancing through Olympic lifting. So with that, if you are a beginner, um, your first one to three months, this is, this is on average, first one to three months maybe. Um, this could be longer period for those who might have some other deficiencies, but the first one to three months you are wanting to become, you want to become proficient with the sumo deadlift high pull, the med ball clean, and do lots of front squatting and overhead squatting. And you want to make sure that your mobility is satisfactory and that you're capable of doing all of those movements with a PVC pipe or an empty bar very well. And when you start transitioning to an empty bar, uh, the PVC pipe and the bar need to look exactly the same. Um, as far as periodizing for your strength and, uh, and building strength through the movements, you want to really prioritize the stability and the strength portions of your training because you need to go through some long-term adaptations to start lifting some heavy weight. So this first few months is very critical in terms of building, uh, building up joint stability and building up muscular strength for the uh, more intermediate portion of your weightlifting journey. Next, we're going to get into the intermediate portion, which is sometime after you've started to load up a little bit of weight beyond the uh, beyond the empty bar, I would still say that your intermediate, um, anywhere between three months up all the way to two, sometimes even three years as an intermediate lifter. I've been lifting for three to four years and I would consider myself uh, an upper intermediate lifter, nowhere near advanced, okay? Um, but in, in this portion of your training, you want to really be slowly working towards your body weight clean or a body weight snatch, um, which is which is pretty hefty for uh, for a lot of folks, and it is it's a great goal. But you really in this portion, you're going to be optimizing the large flaws in your lifts. You're going to be optimizing the transitions between your pulls, um, how you're actually starting the lift, uh, the the differences in in the types of jerks that you're that you're looking for, your footwork, your uh, your grip, things like that. Uh, as far as the actual strength portion and periodization training, um, you're going to continue the stability and strength uh, as with the beginner phases, but you're also going to start including some more intermediate power training phases to start uh, adapting the body to moving fast under a load. So that's very important for the stability portion is being able to move fast under the load and stay stable under that load the entire time. And finally, once you reach the advanced stage, which is really going to be up to uh, the advice of a coach or a professional, uh, once you really reach that advanced stage, which tends to be beyond the three-year mark, um, you're really just going to be optimizing the small flaws in technique. And, and you'll notice that um, even elite lifters, if you go and you check out that hook grip page that I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, those 
lifters are still optimizing small flaws and they've been lifting for 15, 20, 30 plus years. Okay, so um, uh, the optimization of technique never, never stops and uh, you're always looking uh, for fine detail in order to increase the amount of weight that you're lifting. Um, you really want to pay close attention to the periodization of your stability, strength, and power in order to optimize your training regimen for, uh, for competition. Ideally, advanced lifters, um, those are the type of people who are going to be lifting in competition. So, um, and also this last note little of lift heavy, lift often, that can apply to intermediate lifters and advanced lifters alike. If you lift heavy, your body's gonna get used to lifting heavy and you'll start building those adaptations that we're looking for for strength and for power. So lift heavy, lift often, and squat lots, my friends. There you go. Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's lab. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, today was an extension on last week's lab, and these are some more advanced principles, uh, or at least advanced lifts. Now what we took you through today was more of the introductory content. Um, today is a participation lab, and so in lieu of a lab report for this week, what we would like to have you do is simulate some of these movements. We'd like you to record your, your simulated movements and then, uh, and then post that. I'll, I'll create a space for that under your, your lab sec, uh, session. You'll see that on, on dashboard. So here's what we'd like to have you do. For plyometrics, we'd like to have you do three different movements. Okay, so please record yourself doing squat jumps, ice skaters, and lateral double leg hops based on, on what we simulated and showed you today. So we want you to do that. I'd like you to do three reps for each. Three squat jumps, then three ice skaters on each side, and then three uh, lateral double leg hops. And again, for that, you'll need to either put down some tape or just, just use something as a line to hop back and forth over, okay? Uh, that should take you, that should, that, should, um, that should not take you too long. Then you'll progress onto the Olympic lifts, okay? Uh, and based on the examples that Cole gave to you, you'll need to study those and you need to practice these before you record these. I'd like you to do three reps of front squats, three reps of overhead squats, three reps of sumo deadlift high pulls, and then three lifts of med ball cleans, or you can use your backpack as shown. And for these up here, for the front squats, overhead squats, sumo deadlift high pulls, you can use a PVC pipe or a broom handle or, or a, a long stick. That would work just fine also, okay? So three reps of each of these. And then to conclude, what, what I'd like to have you do is five reps of your choice. Uh, I'd like you to go through the, mo the movement progression that Cole showed you and was presented to you. Uh, and I'd like to have you either do that for the snatch or for the clean and jerk, not both. So five reps of the movement progression for uh, either one of those, and that's your choice. Thank you for your attention today, and, and hopefully you enjoy participating in these movements. They're fun to move. Uh, they're fun to go through and, and it provides a, a definitely a good workout even just simulating the movements without weight and uh, And that's the final thing I would I would encourage you to do as we get down here Please stay away from from any weight on this for now with the exception of the medicine ball or backpack that you're using